This is lecture 13, um, and the name of this lecture is Lehmann Schaffe, which is an, the a name of a theorem that will be central to this lecture. So this will be the last lecture where we talk about um, binding optimal um, point estimators. Um, and after this lecture, we will start talking about convergence um, and convergence of random variables. So as a real quick review for last time, Last time we talked about a theorem called the Rao Blackwell theorem. And the Rao Blackwell theorem was concerned with if we take an estimator, an unbiased estimator, how can we improve that unbiased estimator? And we can use a process called Rao Blackwellization to take a kind of bad estimator of some quantity and use it to make a better estimator of that quantity. And if we do that carefully, today we're going to show we can use that Rao Blackwellization to make the best possible estimator. So the Rao Blackwell theorem says if we have an estimator theta hat and theta hat is unbiased for some function tau of theta, um, some function of our unknown parameter theta, and w um, is a sufficient statistic for theta, then if we define a new estimator, that I'm calling here phi. And phi is going to be formed, and you can think of it as phi or phi of w, is going to be formed by looking at the conditional expectation of our maybe bad but unbiased estimator, theta hat, given the sufficient statistic. And what we showed last time is that if we do this, so this is often known as Rao Blackwell and Rao Blackwellization will take our maybe poor but unbiased estimator theta hat and turn it into a better and still unbiased estimator phi. And if we do this, phi will have the following properties. First, phi will still be unbiased. So if I look at the expected value of phi, which in some way, right, so theta hat involves x, w involves x, and this phi will somehow involve x. It will be a statistic as long as w is sufficient. We saw that this statistic phi will be unbiased for tau of theta, so it will have the same expectation as theta hat. However, it will have a lower variance so the variance of phi will be never more than the variance of theta hat. And so somehow we have improved upon theta hat. And the third thing, just to make sure, is that phi is a statistic, which really means it doesn't uh, depend on theta. And so in some ways, phi is this kind of better estimator. So this was the Rao Blackwell theorem. It was taking our probably poor estimator and improving it. So we want to use Rao Blackwell to find the best possible estimator. And before we get there, we want to prove um, a, a nice result that was related to the, th the proof of the Rao Blackwell theorem. And the nice result that kind of lets us sleep better at night is that UMBUEs, so UMBUEs, are indeed unique. So there's a little bit of a um, 
a worry we could have here that UMB weaves may not be unique um, and that we could have multiple best estimators, but it turns out that's not possible. Um, and this is a nice short little proof. And so this will be useful because it will allow us to find the UMB weight, which is going to be guaranteed to be unique. Our proof of this is going to proceed by contradiction. And so we're going to assume we have um, two UMB UEs. W1 and W2, where, um, and we should say these are U and B UEs of whatever function tau of theta is. And we're going to assume that W1 is not equal to W2. So they're not the same statistic but they're both unbiased for tau of theta and they have the same variance and there is no estimator um, with a lower variance. But there is an estimator with an equivalently low variance that is not the same estimator. Now, this is not possible. We're gonna assume it, it happens and then we're gonna show that if this were to happen, we get a contradiction and so this cannot happen. So it's kind of a nice example of proof by contradiction. So how can we do this? We're going to use these two UMB weeds to make a third estimator that has a lower variance, which shouldn't be possible. So we can define a W3 by just averaging together W1 and W2. Notice here, if I average together W1 and W2, I'm not going to change the expected value of W3. So the expected value of W3 is going to be one half expected value of W1 plus one half the expected value of W2. And so that's one half tau of theta plus one half tau of theta is tau of theta. And so this thing is still unbiased. So W3 is unbiased. tau theta. Okay. Now let's look at the variance. Also, the variance of W3 is the variance of 1 half W1 plus 1 half W2. Now I'd like to distribute my variance across this, but I can't. Um, I don't know that W1 and W2 are independent. So I have to actually include the covariance term. Nonetheless, I can say this is one fourth the variance of W1 plus a fourth the variance W2 plus a half, whoops, the covariance between W1 and W2. So I get a half because it should be um, two times one quarter. Right, okay, so, um, okay. And so let's consider this covariance term. The covariance of W1 and W2, we showed last time that for any random variable that the square of the covariance is always less than or equal to the product of the variances. Right? So we had we had done that last time, and that's just generally true for any random variable. It's not particularly um, incisive fact, but it's true. And equivalently, we could take the square root, so we could say that the covariance of um, between W1 and W2 is less than or equal to the square root of the variance. Um, the product of variance between W1 and W2. Okay, so we can use this inequality to get an upper bound for the variance of W3. Let's just change colors. The variance of W3 is less than or equal to quarter variance of W1 plus 
quarter parents of W2, all right? So I'm just copying up from, from here, right? But now we have a bound, so we can say plus, since I have a less than or equal to, plus a half times the square root of the variance. I'll just write V for variance because I'm I'm kind of lazy. Okay. So we've gotten a bound for the variance of W3 in terms of just the variance of W1 and the variance of W2. Let me write this on the next line just so it's less confusing. That's half square root variance of W1 variance of W2. Okay. Well, what do we know about the variance of W1 and W2? They're both U and VUEs, right? And since they're both U and VUEs, we don't know exactly what the variance is. But since W1 and W2 are both U and VUEs, then they both have the lowest possible variance. So the variance of W1 is the same thing as the variance of W2. And so we can just replace this with a quarter variance of W1 plus a quarter, oops, that should be a quarter, right? A quarter variance of W2 is just the same thing as variance of W1 plus a half. And this would be the variance of W1 squared, the square root. which is just the variance of W1. So altogether, we've shown that the variance of W3 is not more than the variance of W1, right? So this altogether, right? It's a quarter, quarter and a half is just the variance of W1. So altogether, we've just shown that this W3 has a variance that is not bigger than either W1 or W2. Now we didn't show it's smaller, yeah, but we have shown that the variance is not bigger. And so um, since W1 and W2 are U and VUEs, <clears throat> um, it must be that we can't have a variance W3 less than the variance of W1 because W1 and W2 are, var are U and VUE. So it must be equality. It must be that it's equal to. All right, so the variance of all these W is the same. The variance of W1 and W2 and W3. So we basically created another U and VUE. So if we have equality here, so this is really an equal sign, it can't be less than, it has to be an equals. Then up here, this also is really an equal sign, which says that the covariance between W1 and W2 is really equal to the, the product of these, because that's where we got our inequality from, right, is we brought down that thing. And so if we say that, well, you know, the, we've shown that the variance of W3 is not bigger than the variance of W1 or W2, and it can't be smaller because W1 and W2 have the smallest possible variance, it must be equal, which means that from that inequality, we got the inequality from saying that the covariance is less than or equal to the square root of the variances. But if that less than or equal to sign is really a equal sign, then this must hold. It must be that um, this is actually an equality. Not a less than or equal to. Because if it was a less than or equal to, we'd run it. Or if it was less than, we draw in the problems, it can't be less than it, so it's just an equals. And so if we move this thing to the other side, i.e. the covariance of W1, W2 over the square root of the variances of these things, 
is equal to 1. So it's moving that square root thing over. But this thing, of course, we call the correlation between w1 and w2. So we've just shown that the correlation between w1 and w2 is 1. So let's revisit what we said at the beginning of this thing. We said that w1 and w2 are u and v weights, but they're not equal to each other. We've just shown that they, um, that they are perfectly correlated, though. Maybe they're not equal, but they're perfectly correlated. If the correlation between these things, if the correlation is 1, then it must be, it's true that you're going to get a correlation of only 1 if and only if they're a linear function of each other. They're a perfect linear function of each other. So there must exist some a and b where w1 is a plus b w2, i.e. There is a, they're perfectly linearly related. Now, maybe that's possible. Um, all we said is not equal. We didn't say that they can't be linear functions of each other. However, we have a certain constraint, which is that the expected value of w1 which we call tau of theta, is if w1 is e is a linear function of w2, this would be a plus b, the expected value of w2. However, we know that this thing, w2, is also unbiased for tau of theta, so that must be also tau of theta. And so what we get is that a it has to be 0 and b has to be 1, i.e., Otherwise, we'd have a tau of theta equals to something that's not, you know, some other thing other than tau of theta, right? If these two are equal, it has to be a is 0 and b is 1, which means that w1 is equal to w2. So this thing has to be 0 and this thing has to be 1, i.e. they're equal. But we said that wasn't allowed. We said they're, they're, they're both u and b ues, but they're different. And so what we've shown is that if you assume you have two u and b ues, but they're different U of the UEs. I can show you that, no, they're not different U of the UEs. So you can't possibly have different U of the UEs. We've basically shown a contradiction. And so what that proves is that <clears throat> something here has to give. And so you cannot have two U of the UEs that are different. And so U of the UEs are unique. If we can find them, if they exist, they're unique. So that's um, not too bad of a little theorem, um, and it helps us sleep at night knowing that, you know, if we, um, when we're looking for these U and UEs, they are actually going to be unique. So let's get back to our Rao Blackwell theorem, all right? So now we kind of, you know, made it this far. The reason we do this, this uniqueness proof now is it really follows on from the proof of Rao Blackwell because um, it uses some of these facts, say, for example, that the correlation squared is less than or equal to the product of the variances. You could prove it at any point, but that's, um, this is where we proved it. So what does this have to do with Rao Blackwell? We want to use Rao Blackwell not only just to improve a bad estimator, but to improve it as much as possible and use Rao Blackwellization to make the best estimator to make the U and B U E. And the way to do this was proven by, well, two people named Lehman and Chaffe, and they have a theorem named after them called the Lehman Chaffe theorem. I think there's also an accent in Kramer Rao, but I'm, I'm not very good at these things. Um, but uh, Eric. Eric, Erlich, Lehman, and someone, Chappé, um, very big names in the 20th century um, of uh, kind of the theoretical statistics, which is really what this course is based on. And Lehman Chaffe basically sets out the situation in which we can make this, um, in which case we can um, uh, use Rao Blackwellization to find the best estimator. So this theorem is, um, to state it properly technically, so, or properly correctly, it's a little bit technical. 
So we're not going to get into too much into the weed, technical weeds. But I'm going to, I'll state the theorem and then we'll talk about it because it might seem a bit vacuous. So let W be a sufficient, let's say a sufficient, and I'm going to leave a space here ominously, statistic for theta. And let um, well, let's call it theta hat um, be an estimator for tau theta. Maybe we should say an unbiased estimator. Tau theta that depends on my x's only through w. So what that means is I can write theta hat is, you could write it, think of it as theta hat is some function of this w, and w is a sufficient statistic for theta. So an estimator theta hat can depend on x's in many ways, but if the only way it depends on x is through w, right? So w, let's just more explicitly, right? w is a statistic, and so it depends on our x's. And <clears throat> theta is another statistic. And it will depend on your x's, but maybe theta has a certain form that it's theta is a function of w. You can write as w. You can think of it as, you know, my x's only appear here as through my function w. So theta hat is basically like I don't know, w squared or something, right? It only, and so the x's come in through the fact that, you know, that theta is a function of w. They don't come in any other way. So this is kind of reminiscent of the um, sufficient, uh, sufficient uh, the factorization theorem for sufficient statistics. It's very reminiscent of that, um, where in that theorem we had to show there's some function g that depends on the data only through t, um, or whatever our statistic is, and this is a similar kind of thing. So we have a theta hat that only depends on the data through w. So the x's won't appear in any other way except as um, in the, the kind of form of w. Then... And this thing, this theta hat, is unbiased for tau. Then theta hat is the UMBUE for its expectation, tau of theta. So it seems like I've just told you that there are no real restrictions on being the UMBUE. Um, but that's not quite. So let's parse this theorem and let's, let's relate it back to the Rao Blackwell theorem. Basically, what it's saying is that if I have an estimator that is a function of my data, it's unbiased for the quantity I want, so it's unbiased for tau of theta, and it's a function of the data only through the sufficient statistic w, then it is the U and B U E. And what does this have to do with Rao Blackwell? So we go back up to the statement of Rao Blackwell. Here, for example, this phi is a function of w. All right, so we made this phi, and it's a function of w. And um, it is unbiased, and it has a lower variance. And we said here that W had to be sufficient. So why does the Rao Blackwell theorem not say this is also the UMBUE? There's a technical condition that W also has to satisfy, and that's the condition is called completeness. And I've de-emphasized this in the course. Um,
And so W really has to be what's called a complete sufficient statistic, not just any sufficient statistic. So the Rao Blackwell theorem works for any sufficient statistic. There's this other property called completeness, um, and it is a fairly technical property, um, and it's kind of a more advanced graduate level topic we're going to de-emphasize. For this course, I'm not going to give you a sufficient statistic that is not complete, because um, that would be very mean. And most of the things that you would interact with um, in the normal course of doing statistics are going to be complete. But it's a pretty technical condition. And um, so we're going to kind of de-emphasize it and just think of it as sufficient statistic. However, you know, if you look at the Rao Blackwell, and you'd say, well, Rao Blackwell only requires sufficiency. So why do we even have this separate theorem? Because Rao Blackwell does it very technically only require sufficiency. Lehman Chafe requires another property called completeness. Completeness is basically like being minimal. It's basically being the smallest possible. Um, so in many cases, it is equivalent to being called a minimal sufficient statistic. It's basically being the most com kind of compact version. But pretty much everything that we've come across so far, in fact, probably everything we've come across so far, is not only sufficient, but is complete. And so in this course, we're going to assume that if you have something that's sufficient, it is complete. And I'm not going to give you something that isn't. So basically, for the purpose of this course, if you go read something else, you need to realize you might run across this word complete. But for the purpose of this course, basically, Lehman Chafe says that if we can form an unbiased estimator for tau of theta out of a sufficient statistic, that thing is the best estimator. So let me just write that basic summary. If I can form an unbiased estimator um, for tau of theta out of a sufficient statistic, it is the UMD. U, e. And that's basically the, the, the punchline for this course. Um, now, depending on my tau, that might be a, a, a hard process or not. Um, it just depends on how sadistic I want to be in giving you a certain hard tau. Because it's potentially easy to find sufficient statistics. But I not only need to find a sufficient statistic, I need to find a function. So I need to find a w. I need to find a function, uh, theta hat, that is unbiased for tau. So let's look at this in practice. But um, Lehman Chafe basically, so it's again, it's related to Rao Blackwell because one way you could get the best estimator is if I find anything. Um, that is unbiased, any theta hat, and I Rao Blackwellize it using a sufficient W, that's going to be the UMBUE. So if I can find anything that's unbiased and I Rao Blackwellize it to make theta, I'm mean, sorry, to make phi, so I have theta hat, I Rao Blackwellize it on a sufficient statistic, this phi will be the UMBUE. Now, technically, W has to be complete sufficient, not just sufficient, but for this course, we're going to take them as the same thing. Um, so Rao Blackwell basically says that two here, it is the lowest variance. So you can kind of replace it with that. Technically, it's a different theorem, um, but for this course, we can kind of merge them. So that's one way. One way is I, I have some theta hat that's unbiased, but it's a crap estimator. I have W that's sufficient, but not unbiased. And I wrap black them together, and I get uh, phi, and that thing is unbiased, and it's the UMBUE. The other way of going about this is if I can just guess some function of W that's unbiased for tau of theta, that will be the UMBUE. All right. So this kind of, we'll see both approaches today. Let's look at an example. Right? Basically, if I can figure I have some unbiased. Um, Yeah, if I if I can form an unbiased estimator 
for tau of theta out of a sufficient statistic w, it's the UMB we example. So it's a little bit stilted of a of um of a of the proposition of the theorem, but in practice it's well could be easy, could be hard, depending on uh, how mean I'm gonna be. Let's pick our favorite type of data, which is normal. And um uh, I don't know, let's just say let's say sigma squared, but this thing is known. And all we're trying to estimate is mu, which is unknown. Okay. And the question is, although we know the answer to this is what is the UMB? Uh, not for x bar, oh, I'm giving away the game for mu. Now we've done this several ways. We've done the Kramer row lower bound, and we use that to show that this that x bar, right? Our hint is x bar, right? We showed that it's the best with Kramer row. We actually row blackballized um, things, and we derived x bar as um, well the best estimator. How's another way? Another way is use Lehman Shafay. L E, how do you spell this? And so, how do we use Lehman Shafay? One, I need a W that is sufficient for mu. W, which is x bar, is sufficient for mu. And two, I need to guess, so maybe one, I should say, find sufficient statistic for mu. Two is guess um, a function of w that is unbiased for mu. So this is not hard. What's a function of x bar whose that function is and expectation mu. Well, just x bar itself. Let's just let theta hat be x bar, which is, of course, a function of mu. It's a very simple, or a function of w. It's a very simple function of w, just the identity function. Then expected value of theta hat is, of course, mu. All right, so mu is our tau of mu. It's very simple in this case. And so three, and so x bar is the u m b u e. So that's pretty damn simple. I didn't have to find the information, no Kramer row lower bound, nothing like that. So now, having gone through all that and derived the Kramer row lower bound and proved all this stuff, which is a real pain to do, you can appreciate how simple that is. Now, technically, in big boy PhD level land, you would have to show that x bar is not only um, sufficient, but complete sufficient. In this course, for a, I'm not going to give you something that's not complete. So it's um, it's sufficient, and it's a simple function. I've guessed it a nice function for um, mu, which is just x bar itself. And there you go. Bob's your uncle, right? Uh, x bar is the UMB UE, and that was really simple to do. Let's um let's make this a little more more difficult. Let's have tau of mu be mu squared. It's supposed to be a two there. I'm sure it looks like it. So that's um that's a little bit harder. The first step is is pretty easy. So it's sufficient statistic for mu. All right. W is x bar is sufficient for mu. Technically, you would have to show that through factorization theorem, but at this point in the course, we're going to take that as known. And then two, we have to guess a function. Well, one way of doing this is guess a function of x bar of w, whatever you want to call it, uh, whose expectation is 
is mu squared. Right. Now, that's a little bit harder. What's a function of x bar whose expectation is mu squared? So this is actually a good point where you could pause the lecture and you could say, can I come up with this? Because this is the kind of thing you'll be asked to do in homework or on the exam. Is do a little thinking about what do I know about x bar? Can I figure out some function of x bar that is unbiased or whose expectation is mu squared? So maybe pause it here, see if you can get it. One thing we could try Maybe x bar squared, right? If x bar is going to be the u and b ue for, for a mu, maybe x bar squared is the u and b ue for mu squared, right? That worked for um, MLEs, right? If x bar is the MLE for mu, x bar squared is the MLE for mu squared. Unfortunately, it's not going to work for u and b ue's because squaring things is not going to nicely preserve expectation. So, What's the expected value of x bar squared? Well, our shortcut formula says this is the variance of x bar plus the expected value of x bar quantity squared. And what's that? Our variance of x bar we know is sigma squared over n. Uh -oh. And our expectation is mu and then quantity squared. So that's like almost an unbiased estimator. Uh, for mu squared. There is a mu squared in there, so it's not a horrible guess. But we have the sigma squared over n in there. And that is, right, so x bar squared itself ain't going to work because uh, it's expectation of sigma squared over n plus mu squared, not just mu squared. Of course, if I know sigma squared and I know n, so this is why it's important to, that I specified at the start that I know sigma squared. And of course, you know n, you know the sample size. We could just adjust this. What if I try theta hat is x bar squared, and then I just subtract this thing off, off sigma squared over n. It's a known quantity. Or equivalently, this is a function of w, right? w squared minus sigma squared over n. I'm basically guessing, you know, playing around with things to, to guess a function of my sufficient statistics, x bar or w generally, whose expectation is what I want. If I do this, now we can pretty easily see that the expectation of this thing is the expectation of x bar squared, and the sigma squared over n definitely comes out. So we get sigma squared over n plus mu squared minus sigma squared over n. And that's just mu squared. So that thing is, so this thing is unbiased, this theta hat here is unbiased for mu squared as a red expectation, and we notice that it is a function of the x's only through x bar. So it's a function of my x's only through x bar. And that's what we required for Lehman Jaffe. Lehman Jaffe said that if you can basically, if it were a function of, of the x's only through w, and has the right expectation, then it is the, the u and the ue. So what we can say is, hence, theta hat is x bar squared minus sigma squared over n is the u m b u e for e squared. So that's, you know, so this is the kind of games we can play, um, which is, this is maybe sometimes the easiest way to go about it, which is you just you find the sufficient statistic and then you're basically trying to play around and guess at the function of that sufficient, sufficient statistic that gives you the expected value you want. Okay, let's look at a proof of Lehman Jaffe and then we'll do some more examples to round out the lecture. Proof of Lehman Jaffe. All right, so again, basically we, the, the statement of this thing was was that theta hat is um, some function of w 
um, and w is sufficient. Technically, it's complete sufficient, but we'll ignore that. And then um, if expected value of theta hat is what I want, theta hat is the U M V U E for this thing I want. So that's the that's the statement of it. So we're going to prove it using Rao Blackwell. All right. So there's, here's the here's the connection. Let um, what do we want to say? We want to say let V be another unbiased estimator of tau of theta. And what we're going to show will show that the variance of this theta hat is less than or equal to the variance of, of V, i.e. theta hat is the U M V U E. Right? That's all it means to be the U M V U E. If I have another unbiased estimator, the variance of my theta hat is lower than that variance of the other unbiased estimator. So we're going to take some other unbiased estimator of tau or theta and um, this is kind of what we're going to show. Let's row blackwellize it. Blackwell says, Rao Blackwell says that if V of W, we Rao Blackwellize V by looking at the conditional expectation of V given W, then one, the variance of phi is less than or equal to the variance of V, and two, the expected value of V is the same thing as the expected value of V, which is tau of theta since it's unbiased. So we have this other estimator, phi now, and phi is also a function of w, right? So we have our theta hat, which is a function of w, and we've just made another um, unbiased estimator of, of uh, tau of theta that is also a function of the x's only through w. And what we want to show is that, um, well, we want to show, um, we want to show this, which is that the variance of, of, of um, theta hat is less than the variance of V. And so we're going to basically abuse the second, the second, or this first point there. So let G of W just be the difference it's going to be um, theta hat of w minus v of w. Okay, so we have this theta hat, which is a function of the x is only through w, and you just made this phi through Rao Blackwell that is also a function of the x is only through w. And so we can take the difference between them and let g be that. Then the expected value of g is the expected value of theta hat minus the expected value of um, uh, phi. And both of these have this, they're both unbiased for tau of theta. And so the expected value of g is zero. Now here's where I'm going to wave my hands a little bit. This is true. for all possible theta. Any possible true underlying theta, nothing I've said here um, depends on exactly what the underlying value of theta. So this is true for all possible values of theta. So if I vary theta, um, I'll, get, I'll get different taus of theta, but my expectation of the difference is always is zero. Um, and so it must be that g of w is identically always zero. 
And this basically is using the property called completeness of W. The W we said is sufficient for this course, that's good enough. Technically it has another property called completeness. The point being is that basically what we can show is that because for any possible theta, the difference, this expectation is zero, it must, the only way that's gonna happen if I change my thetas and it's always zero is this, if this G function is always zero, i.e. G of W, so zero is G of W is, what did we say? It's theta hat of W minus B of W. So theta hat of W is the same thing as V of W. So you can kind of believe that. Basically what was shown is that, um, and technically to prove it technically correct, you have to use this property called completeness, but it doesn't really matter. The point being is that basically I've formed this other estimator and what I can show is that because I can play this game for any possible theta and this other estimator, it has to be that these two that these two things are the same because if I um, look at they're both a function of, of w and so I can kind of look at the expectation over all possible values of theta and the only way you get that happening is that the difference of the expectation is is zero because this thing is some function of w and this theta this is some v of w and the only way that I'm going to get the difference between these two functions of w identically always giving me zero is if theta hat and phi are the same thing. And so, um, so basically we've shown that theta hat and phi are the same thing. And we can go back and we can grab this property because now we know that theta hat and phi are the same thing. So the variance of theta hat is the variance of phi. And the variance of phi is less than or equal to the variance of our other unbiased estimator v. And that's all we wanted to show. We have shown that the variance of this thing is less than or equal to the variance of this thing. And that's all we wanted to show. That shows that theta hat is the UMB UE. That's the basic uh, outline of the proof. It was a little bit hand wavy because I didn't really formally define completeness. Not super important. You don't need to recapitulate the proof. What you do need to be able to do is use the theorem. And you need to be able to use the theorem to find the UMBUE. So what's the practical advice there? The takeaway mes message from Lehman Chaffe is procedure basically of how to find the UMB U-M-B-U-E. And the basic takeaway take message, um, how to find the U-M-B-U-E with Lehman Chaffe is one, we want to find a sufficient statistic W for theta. And then two, we want to find a function theta hat of w so that the expected value of theta hat of w, so we want to find some function w so that the expected value of this function of w is, um, is whatever tau of theta we want. So how do we find the U of B U E with Lehman Chaffe? Let's say U of B U E for whatever function of our parameter we want to estimate. And this kind of has two sub ways of doing this. One, which is basically guess. So we could just guess. Guess, um, guess theta hat. Maybe, you know, if we go back up to our example where we want the U of B U E of mu squared, I said, well, what about x bar squared? And I said, well, it's not quite that, but if I adjust it a little bit, I'll get the, the thing I want. So that's one legitimate way of doing it, is you just guess the correct function to get your U and B U E. Um, 
and that's a legitimate way of solving the problem. The second way, so let's say guess theta so that the expected value of theta hat is tau. Now theta hat, you know, we have to guess whatever the function theta hat of w so that it does it correctly. The second way of doing this is actually you can just use Rao Blackwell. Nobody likes doing this because it, it involves these conditional expectations everyone hates. But you can actually just, there is a prescriptive way of doing this, which is you can use Rao Blackwell and you can say find any unbiased estimator for tau of theta. Um, let's call it, I don't know, B, as we did before, and two, um, let theta hat be the conditional expectation. Let's row blackwellize V. And that is the UMB we, because that theta hat is a function, the row blackwellized is a function of W, and it has the correct expectation because we know B has the correct expectation. And so you can actually just prescriptively use Rao Blackwell to create the UMB UE. Um, I don't know which is easier. It depends on the problem. But oftentimes you can guess it. And so that's probably the easiest way for this course. But sometimes um, sometimes you can, um, yeah, sometimes you can, you can use Rao Blackwell. Um, let's look at how to do that, actually. That would be a good example to do. So let's go back, re let's revisit um, the example where our data is normally distributed um, and sigma squared is known and we want the u and the u e for u squared, right? So the way we had done this before and probably the easier way is to just guess the form of this thing. We had guessed it and we said it's x bar squared minus sigma squared over n. And that we, the show was the u and the u e. The other way is just to use Rao Blackwell. So let's go back to here. Let's use Rao Blackwell. So we kind of did previously this, this one. We can, we can show you get the same answer by doing two, but you don't have no guesswork involved. It's purely calculation. Probably not easier, but it can be done. And so to use Rao Blackwell, what do we need? I need any unbiased estimator, and then I'm going to Rao Blackwellize it based on x bar. So what do we need to do is one, what would we call it? Well, let's just call it one. One find any unbiased estimator of u squared. Now, what's an unbiased estimator of u squared? For any different indices, so m and m not equal, the expected value of xn times xm, as long as n and m are not the same thing, these are in xn and xm are independent And so we can factor that expectation. The expected value of each of these is just mu. And so that gives us mu squared. So that's our bad estimator. I guess we're calling it V here. V that. The product of two of these observations. And that's a crap estimator, right? Because it only involves two of our data points. And we have a bunch of data points. And that's okay, we can Rao Blackwellize it. And how do we Rao Blackwellize it? We need our sufficient statistic for mu, which is x bar. And then what we do is we say theta hat is the expected value of 
v given w. And in this case, v is xn times xm, and w is x bar. So we need to calculate that expectation. Now, it's not necessarily trivial to see all the tricks here, but I, I just want to do this example to show you that there is another kind of prescriptive procedure. It, it, presumably, if I can calculate this conditional expectation, whatever that thing is, is the U of the UE. So um, if I look at this, 1 over n times n minus 1, and then I'm going to sum over all indices n and m that are not equal. So here's my notation for that. I'm going to sum over all indices n and m that are not equal. And I'm going to sum up this thing, this expected value of xn by xm, given x bar. Now, I can push that sum inside. Something like that. And I'm going to make a claim here, which is that if I look at the sum of xn's quantity squared, what is this? Well, it's going to be the sum of the squares of them plus all the cross product terms. And I'm just going to say it's a sum m not equal to n of these cross product terms, right? That's what you get when you sum stuff up, right? It's like x squared plus a, uh, you know, what is it? x squared plus 2a, what am I saying? x squared plus 2xy plus y squared, right? It's these square root quadratic, right? And this is the bigger version of it. The sum of a bunch of the things, and I square it. You're going to get the sum of the squares plus all the cross product terms. And so I can rearrange to get this thing in terms of the, the square of the sums and the sum of the squares. And um, so I have my n, n minus 1, my expected value. And this thing, I can basically use this, this thing here to say this is the sum of um, what do I want to say? The sum squared minus the sum of the squares, right? Of course, we still conditional on x bar. And um, I'm going to make a further claim here that this thing here is basically that if I look at the sum of the squares is basically n minus 1 times my sample variance squared minus n x bar squared. Um, and so why does that make, make some sense? This is basically um, shortcut variance formula. But instead of expectations, it's just in terms of sums. So this is basically, right, so the shortcut variance formula says that the variance of, of x is equal, well, let me just write it down here, right, let's just say the variance of x, some random variable x is the expected value of the square minus the square of the expected value, or the square, uh, the expected value of the square is the variance um, plus the square of the expected value. So this is a fact we use all the time. And then I'm just going to basically replace these with their sample versions. This is like the sum of this xn squared. Um, this is like s squared. Um, this is like 1 over that. This is like s squared. And this is pretty much like the sum of the xn's squared. Um, and, uh, oh, I guess I divide that by n, right? So that's in there. So basically, you can uh, rearrange this. I have some n's on top instead of that. But that's basically where why I can claim that this thing is true. Indeed, it is true. But it's, it's purely just some algebra. Um, but that's this, this down here is basically the justification. Not super important. You can believe it's true. And so what I can do, 
the reason I want to do this is because I know something about the expected value of s squared, and I know something about the expected value of x bar squared, right? Um, so what am I left with? This is n x bar squared. That's what that thing is, right? And the parens is n x bar, or the sum of the x bends. And um, I get a minus n minus 1 by s squared. And I get a minus minus, which would be a plus n x bar squared. Okay, so I get something like that. And finally, what do I get if I do this all out? n by n minus 1. And then um, I'm going to get an n squared. Notice this is conditional on x bar, right? The expected value of any random variable given itself is just the random variable itself. So when I'm calculating, say, the expected value of x bar squared given x bar, this is just going to be n, n squared x bar squared minus <clears throat> n minus 1 um, and the expected value of s squared given x bar is going to be sigma squared um, and the expected value of x bar squared given x bar is just another n x bar quantity squared. So the reason why we can just basically ignore that expectation is because we're conditioning on x bar. And this s squared, um, if I know x bar, this doesn't matter. The expected value of s squared is um, the sigma squared, which we know. And so then I basically get some cancellations. We get n squared um, plus n. Did I do that right? Am I missing a minus sign somewhere? Um, I think I'm missing a minus sign somewhere, aren't I? Oh, this should be a plus, shouldn't it? Which would make this a minus sign. I'm looking at this going, this isn't right, all right? That should be a plus, surely, um, just as here it's a plus. So that's a minus. That turns into minus. Okay, now we get what I want. And so we get n by n minus 1 in the basement here. And I get an n by n minus 1 by x bar squared minus n minus 1 sigma squared. And uh, so this works out to be x bar squared. Um, minus, uh, sorry, x bar squared minus sigma squared over n, which is my u of the ue. So again, I'm, I'm impressing upon you how nice it is to be able to guess the function, right? So that's a huge pain to do. Nonetheless, it shows that we can actually procedurally go through and row black will eyes the um, use Rao Blackwell to actually find the UMDUE here. Um, it's a bit laborious to do that, um, but we, we can totally do it. And um, we get the same answer. The UMDUE is x bar squared minus sigma squared over n, which is what we guessed previously. Um, if we go back up all the way back up here, that is ultimately okay, what we had guessed the form of. And that was actually simply to do that guessing, um, if you can do it, but if you can't, and um, in any case, at least we can sleep better at night knowing that there is kind of a, um, a procedure we can go through to actually get this correctly. Um, and so we can, we can do it um, kind of uh, methodologically. We could actually just use Rao Blackwell and Rao, if we Rao Blackwell, a complete sufficient statistic, it gives you the U of the UE. So that's why Rao Blackwell is important and why it's basically because Layman Jaffe says that Rao Blackwell gives us the UMDUE if we're conditioning on that sufficient statistic.
Um, and so it's a really powerful theorem and a hell of a lot easier than calculating the Fisher information going through that. So let's just end this lecture by doing one more example. And um, my example is not going to be something nice like normal. I'm going to look at um, a uniform distribution between 0 and theta. And when we had used, um, we had done all that Fisher information stuff, we couldn't actually get an answer for the uniform because the uniform didn't have enough regularity um, to allow that Fisher information to be calculated in the nice way that we wanted. And um, it didn't give us the answer we wanted. Nonetheless, Rao Blackwell has said nothing about regularity. And so Rao Blackwell will work even if we don't have a nice kind of exponential family. So that's one of the other powers of Rao Blackwell is, is a more general theorem and often much easier to apply than calculating Fisher information. I tortured you with that because you appreciate now how easy this can be. Well, the previous example wasn't that easy, but it generally can be. So let's look at another kind of easy example just to end up the lecture. So my claim is that we had shown that that my maximum is sufficient for theta. And that's something we showed quite a while ago, is that the maximum is sufficient for theta. And basically what Lehman Jaffe or Rao Blackwell say is that if I want an unbiased estimator, I'm sorry, if I want the best unbiased estimator for some function of theta, I need to make it, if I just figure out the correct function of the maximum, which is my sufficient statistic, that's going to be it. So my step one, which was to find a sufficient statistic for theta, is done. I'm going to tell you, and we've done it before, that xn, the maximum sufficient for theta. And we couldn't get an answer. We didn't, we, this was the primary example for, um, for the Kramer right lower bound, that it didn't work. And if I want, what maybe I want an unbiased estimator of, of theta. So let me, uh, uh, you know, my ma overall question is U, M, B, U, E. There's definitely too many U's in there. U, M, B, U, E for theta, right? What's my U and B for theta? Well, I got my sufficient statistic for theta, the maximum. And so I want unbiased um, estimator of theta made from my maximum. And how do I do that? So uh, I won't make you prove this, but my claim, it's basically integration, it's not actually too bad. Uh, my claim is that the expected value of the maximum is n over n plus one times theta. So the maximum actually slightly underestimates theta, which makes sense. You're never really gonna observe theta and so if you look at a maximum, you're always going to be slightly smaller than theta. So it's going to un underestimate it. It's going to underestimate it by a certain amount, n over n minus n plus 1. So as your sample size increases, that goes to 1, and you're going to get closer and closer to the true value. Small samples, you're not going to do that well. And so I want an unbiased estimator for theta made from the maximum. Well, how do I do that? Let us, let theta hat be, well, let's just make, say n plus 1 over n, whatever my sample size is n, I say it's n plus 1 over n times the maximum. If I let that be theta hat, then surely the expected value of theta hat is n plus 1 over n times n over n plus 1 theta, which is just theta. So this theta hat is unbiased for theta, and it is a function of the maximum. So theta hat is the U M B U E for theta as determined by or told us by Lehman Chaffe. Um, and so it's that simple. As long as you on hand know the expected value of the maximum of uniform, it's actually really, really simple. And um, so that's kind of 
we just get, you know, we guessed at the function or you got to use um, your knowledge of, of the expectation of, of this thing um, to find the correct function of your sufficient statistic to give you the expectation you want. And that is the UMV UE. Um, now I could ask the question, what's the UMV UE for theta squared? And that's a slightly harder question. Um, it's probably going to relate to the maximum square. Um, that might be a good homework question. Um, I'll leave it here. Um, so this is, we're kind of at, at time. I'm going to stop, stop here. Um, and today we basically went over the Lehman Chaffe theorem, which, which says that Rao Blackwell will basically give us the UMB UE. It's a little technical condition, but we're going to ignore it. Basically, if you, if you want to make the UMV UE, you just need to find the right function of your sufficient statistic to get the expected value that you want so that your estimator is unbiased. You can find a, a function of your sufficient statistic that is unbiased for the, 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 the function of your parameter you want. That's the best, the best you can do. Um, and that's, so that kind of really nicely wraps up and wraps together a whole bunch of concepts that we've talked about in the course so far. So this kind of marks the end of our discussion about finding best estimators. Um, and we're going to talk about, about convergence um, of random variables going forward. So we're going to really shift gears here. Um, but I'll, I'll call this lecture here.